Welcome to Out of the Woods, the Threat Hunting Podcast. Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Out of the Woods Threat Hunting Podcast. This is Scott Poley, and today is a special edition where we get to have an in-depth conversation with one of my friends here, our guest, Christine Pierce, or Major Pierce. Hello, everyone. It, I'm Major Christine Pierce, and I'm glad to be here for the podcast today. So something I like to do, like I'll kind of give a brief introduction of how I know Major Pierce, um, but then I'll let her describe kind of her background and how she got into where she's at now um, and why cyber and things like that. But I actually had the honor of working with Major Pierce and her team. Um, she's with the PA National Guard doing some cyber exercises. Um, so I've done those for, I think, five or six years in a row. It was a pretty good running. Um, had a great time, learned a lot. Um, we learned a lot from each other, I think, as well. Um, and so nothing but positive experiences from there. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll kick it over to you to kind of talk about kind of what you, got you into cyber, uh, why you kind of picked the path you went, and um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. So I did not choose cyber. The Army chose it for me. <laughs> I, it was nothing that I never, ever considered, you know, when I was going through, even going through college. I was a criminal justice major in college, and all through my childhood, all through college, I was determined that when I graduated, I was going to law school and I was going to be a lawyer. And um, during my sophomore year of college, I just walked into the ROTC office and I never had ever considered it before, never thought of ever joining the military. I walked in and I said, hey, I want to join the military today. And they looked at me like, are you sure you want to join the military? I'm like, yep, sign me up, sign me up right now. So I signed up. I didn't know what I was signed up for. Um, I signed up for active duty, apparently. Mm -hmm. And so that, then two, two days later, it was September 11th. Oh, so wow. I'm like, I don't know what I just did, but okay, sure. So I finished my two years of college, graduated, got commissioned. And, you know, when you go through the military process to choose a job career path, you go, you get to choose. They, they, you think you get to choose. And I picked military intelligence. I picked military police. I picked everything but cyber. So when I, when I got the accessions packet back and they're like, okay, Lieutenant Pierce at the time, you're going to be a signal officer. And I'm like, what even is that? That wasn't even one of my choices. So off I went to signal school. And that was kind of how I got started in the communications and IT field. And then from there, it's just developed 20 years later. I'm still here and I'm doing cyber <laughs> now and, um, and I love it. So I'm, I'm glad that, you know, it was something that I never would have thought of, but I, it got chosen for me and, and it's a profession that I love and that I know that we are, you know, doing a lot of great things in this field mm -hmm. to keep moving forward. No, I think it's interesting that you were chosen to go into cyber and you didn't really know what that was even when you were looking at options. I think that's something we see as far as a deficit for talent is people coming out of high school or people like they don't really know what the field is other than it kind of sounds sexy now when people talk about hacking and things like that. Um, but it's not uh, something that people are really fully aware of all the different components to go into that. Which kind of brings me to one of my next questions. Um, and I I kind of learned a lot about it. It's kind of been a while since I've talked to folks on different teams. Um, but I was introduced that there was different components and team types, right, in the military as far as like their roles and responsibilities and things like that. And I was wondering if you can kind of uh, lightly break down some what are those cyber components of the type of teams and their responsibilities per se? Sure. So the team that I'm on is a defensive cyber operations element, and we, we're very small, and we are focused on mostly vulnerability-centric. So our teams are going out, we are trying to identify vulnerabilities in our customer networks, and then helping that customer remediate those vulnerabilities. There's other types of teams out there, they're called cyber protection teams, and they're more threat hunting, threat focused, 
And mm-hmm. they're the ones that are out there on the hunt. They're looking for those indicators of compromise, very much intelligence driven operations. And then they'll pass it off. Once they do their part, they'll pass it off to the next type of team who maybe be the defense team or uh, the remediation team. Um, so they're the two main types of cyber teams that we have in the army. The air force has um, a variety of teams as well. And um, there's also in our um, tactical communications, we're starting to implement smaller pockets of cyber teams that are focused on more of that electronic warfare and okay. um, commun- yeah. So we each division now and each brigade has like a small little cyber team that they call it that are focused on EW electronic warfare and surveillance and kind of jamming communications and using the cyber components in the tactical world in all of the vehicles to try to uh, use that to their advantage against the enemy. So all different kinds of cyber, whether it's um, in the tactical world, on the battlefield, whether it's, you know, us, you know, the, the penetration testers, the, the defenders, and then the threat hunters. So we have all kinds of cyber going on right now in the military. We, it's hard to keep straight. <laughs> right. I know. That's why I, I remember some of the teams you mentioned. And even then I was like, I can't remember the acronyms because, you know, the military is full of acronyms <laughs> for the name of the teams, right? Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the part I thought was really cool too, working with the different teams and understand their capabilities. And yeah, I, I know in those exercises, there's a lot of joint work, right. Between the air force, Navy and army and so forth. So in their professional team aspect, is there still joint work or do you guys still kind of break off by branch? Oh no, we are fully joint now. So even um, Cyber Shield this year coming up, we just started planning already. We've got Coast Guard, we've got Space Force, we've got Marines, we've got Navy, and we've got Army and Air Force. We have all services that now come to a lot of our cyber exercises. And we're also bringing in a lot of international partners. So this will be the second Cyber Shield this year where um, we're going to have our state partner, state partner partners, I guess you call them. So we had like Ukraine last year, Georgia, Armenia, Israel. So um, we're bringing Lithuania this year for the Pennsylvania team. So in a joint capacity, uh, a lot of times the Army will work side by side with the Air Force team because we um, it, we do that in the real world. So if there's a real cyber mission and an incident, then it's going to be a full force of folks coming together to have to respond. So we train that way. So we are very close with our Air Force counterparts in Pennsylvania. We don't have Coast Guard or Navy, but um, we have then our Lithuania partners as well that we're very close to train with. So constantly with training and working and um, very much a joint operation currently. Yeah, very cool. Um, Yeah, I always think it's interesting because I I know you guys get similar training, but there is some niche training in the different branches and seeing you guys come together, I think there's a great learning opportunities for sure. So yeah, we Uh, actually have two two joint teams right now in Lithuania because I'm the only one who stayed back (laughs) for elections. I had to do election security. Uh, Election day was Tuesday in Pennsylvania. So I stayed back to work elections and let my whole team go to Lithuania to do a cyber exercise there. And we brought Air Force and Army and we have one Air Force Army team that's working with Ukraine. And then we have another Air Force Army team that's working with Ignitus, which is one of the electrical companies in Lithuania, and they're doing a red team, blue team exercise. So, oh, very cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it was interesting. You, you mentioned like the things you do for customers, and then you also mentioned election day. Can you kind of speak what kind of engagement you guys have and like what does customer mean for, for you? And then also, I mean, I'm with the election day just happening, I'm, I'm sure it'd be interesting for some people to understand, you know, what kind of role does cyber teams mm-hmm. play in that space? Sure. So being a DCO, we had a defensive cyber operations element. Every state has a team like us. Every state may use them a little bit differently, but Pennsylvania, we are truly a domestic cyber operations team. So a good amount of our time is focused on our state government networks. So I partner with our state agencies, our local governments, our county governments, um, and our school districts. So we've got 500 school districts in PA, 88 state agencies, 67 counties, and a countless number of local governments. So we have a huge customer base. My team is eight people, so it's awesome. Um, But some of the (laughs) things that we do, we just finished our 50th 
pen test for our customers. So we've been doing a lot of that. It's become a lot of cyber insurance companies are now requiring their providers or their customers to have uh, security assessments done in order for them to keep their insurance coverage at the premium that they want so it doesn't get bumped up. So that's where we come in. We've been getting a lot of calls um, to do security assessments, vulnerability assessments, pen tests. We also do red team engagements, which are really fun for us. But um, we are because we are a federal team and we're a, you know, a, a Title 32 team, we can only spend you know a portion of our time doing state operations because you can't mix federal money with state money. So right. we do one, one assessment a month, which legally we're only allowed to do. And currently I am booked out with assessments until April of 2025. And I have wow. 20, 29 customers on the wait list who don't even have a date yet, which would put us out to somewhere like 2028 to get all of those done. And I still get calls every day to get people added to the wait list. And we're trying to add critical infrastructure. So our, you know, our local water treatment facilities, our local um, utilities. So mm-hmm. we um, actually just got legislation passed in Pennsylvania to stand up a state cyber assessment team, which would consist of a lot of our folks, but in a different status so okay. that we can do assessments 24-7 um, using state money. And then we won't, you know, go to jail because we're crossing budget, <laughs> but money lines. It's always right. a always a fight, a struggle. And then yes. election security. Yes. Um, so that's one of the things that we have been adamantly doing with Pennsylvania Department of State, the Office of Administration, the Governor's Office of Homeland Security since the 2016 election. Mm-hmm. Big one back then. Um, so every election, we are on the election day, we're kind of in a standby status. So if we're monitoring things, we're watching, we're seeing, you know, all of the traffic coming through million hits of malicious stuff, trying to penetrate our systems. Um, but most of the work that we do is preventative. So while we're out there doing pen tests and security assessments, we are checking those election systems and those county governments, make sure they truly are air gapped and make sure that they're secure. Uh, whenever a new election system is going to come online or a voting system is going to come online, we will test it. We'll try to penetrate it. We will do like a once over so that we could make sure that what the what the uh, vendor is saying is secure, truly is secure. And then we also do a lot of uh, pen testing with our Department of State to check the home base, to check their systems before any major election. So a little bit of a little bit of everything, but then election day is actually our e- easy part of our job because we're just kind of in autopilot and just praying that nothing goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's what the security professionals state, right? Every time <laughs> you're done with something is like, all right, I've done enough. Like, like kind of yeah. just wait, pause. Yes. <laughs> So um, I know you guys have done some overseas work, and I know it's interesting when people talk about cyber in the military, right? Uh, Like it might not be that people don't look at it as deployable potentially, right? Um, But I know you guys still go overseas and you kind of have partnerships and stuff like that. Can you Mm -hmm. kind of speak to those engagements and what that really means when you go overseas or travel outside the country for cyber stuff? Sure. So from the Army side... I think I've been to Lithuania 25 times now on cyber missions and my team almost just as much. And a lot of what we're doing in the Baltic region, um, obviously their location is always a little bit, you know, where they've, they've got big brother always poking at them. Right. So they're always a under, they're always a, there's always a threat there for them. So we try to come in and help them increase their overall cybersecurity posture, not only in Lithuania, but in the whole Baltic region. So we work with all the Baltic countries. Um, And we've worked on with, we've worked at their elections as well, their presidential election in 2018. We were there for three weeks, just kind of watching things, monitoring things, kind of the same stuff that we do back home for our own elections. We also currently, my guys, they're there now and they're participating in Amber Mist which is the Lithuanian national level cyber exercise. So that's okay. bringing together all of their international partners. It's bringing together all of their industry alongside their, their Ministry of Defense, their National Cybersecurity Center. 
and they're kind of identifying their vulnerabilities in their policies. So they're exercising that right now. Um, we also have an initiative going on with the Regional Cyber Defense Center in Lithuania, and that's a kind of a fusion cell for that region, for the Baltic region. So all the intelligence that comes in will write reports. Uh, we'll also just, where we started to, they want us to work on a industrial control systems IoT range for them. So help them implement okay. a range so that they can kind of test their SCADA systems. So a little bit of everything and just subject matter expertise. We uh, will bring some of our um, professors from universities over to Lithuania so that they can teach classes and then this vice versa, Lithuania University will teach classes to us. So it's a training, it's operational, it's learning, it's a little bit of everything that we do, pretty much what they need, we'll, um, we'll try to accommodate. They want everything all the time, but we, we have so <laughs> a little bit of time to give them and we try to do our best with the resources that we have to keep going over there. Um, the Air Force, they because they are a, a cyber protection team, they actually get deployed every three years or so for okay. a year. And their deployments, sometimes they, they will go overseas and they'll be working with Air Force customers. So they'll go and they'll do vulnerability assessments, pen testing on uh, maybe, you know, aircraft in Germany or something or some, any contractors that work with the Air Force. A lot of times when they deploy, they'll deploy right to their home station. So they'll sit in front of their computers in their office in a deployed status for a year, working with a customer that they get assigned to from big DOD, Air Force. Mm -hmm. And then that's that's kind of how they deploy. So a little bit different than how we do it, but how yeah. we, but it works. So, I mean, you still get to see the world, right? <laughs> Oh, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, I still am traveling at least like at least one week out of the entire every month, sometimes two. And then looking at my calendar over the next year, there's some months where I'm gone for three weeks out of the year doing oh, wow. all kinds of things. So, yep, we're all over the place still. So with some of those engagements, and, I, and I'm not looking at like, do we think we do cyber better than other countries, but more along the lines of we're working with the Baltic states or Lithuania, is their approach to cyber similar to our approach or do they kind of look at cyber and try to solve it in different ways? No, I mean, they really look to the U.S. for a lot of guidance and they also right. look to us for being a standard. So they they actually do a lot of the same things. Like their Amber Mist exercise that they're doing now is almost exactly how we do like a cyber shield. Mm -hmm. So they even like down to the same documents that we use to train for because we pass a lot of that stuff to our partners. Okay. But um and they work with their industry partners as well. Maybe their relationships aren't as strong yet cuz they're getting there. They've only been an independent country for 30 years, so they're still kind of new to just independence. So there's just getting, you know, the trust built with their um critical infrastructure partners, with their governments, with their um its civilians. So they they really have come a long way. We started working with them back in 2014 and I have seen so much progress from the first time I went to the Baltic region until now. Like I remember just going there and I'd be sitting in a room with a bunch of Lithuanians and Latvians and Estonians and no one would talk to each other. They'd all talk amongst <laughs> themselves in their own language to who they knew, but they wouldn't cross talk to any other country and they certainly weren't going to talk to the U.S., Right. So now they're all talking, they share information, they, they're they so close to each other. So they need to be able to to lean on each other if it's right. in a big cyber incident. So now they're actually working together as, as a Baltic region and not just individual countries. So I've seen a lot of progress over there. So it warms my heart to see all the stuff that we, you know, not saying that we've done it all, but we were there to kind of see through yeah, see, the, their, their progress. Yes. Very cool. So you, you touched on you had like eight person team. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Small. So is that, is that fully, you know, do you have room? Like you don't have seats filled. I'm wondering if you have a deficit as far as the size of your team, like the rest of the world sees in the cyber career, right? Where you do, you have more seats, you just can't fill them. Uh, we, we have the opposite problem because we have okay. so many people that want to be a part of cyber and we don't have enough positions. So okay. it's been one of my initiatives to keep building cyber force structure in Pennsylvania. 
And it mm-hmm. really is because of where we are located. We have Virginia, who has a cyber brigade. Mm-hmm. So they've got a lot of force structure. We have Maryland, who has a cyber protection team. We have New Jersey and New York. And all of those states have more cyber force structure for the Army than Pennsylvania does. So when you look across the United States and when National Guard Bureau and DOD is looking, they're like, oh, there's that East Coast. They have so much cyber force structure. Uh, they don't need any more. So we don't get it. And I fight for it. But so we lose a lot of people. So a lot of people that want a cyber position, they'll go to another state locally because they can drive to Virginia for drill or whatever. So I'm still fighting and I do every day to try to get more force structure because I don't like seeing our cyber talent leave Pennsylvania to go somewhere else because there's nowhere for them to go. Well, I know one of the, um, when people ask me what's the best way to break into cyber or if they want to become like really super specialized in certain things, and I know I, I kind of have, I've talked before on this podcast and other times with folks just about academia and some of the hurdles there as far as growing out your skill sets versus um, learning things on your own. And I still think the military has a great path. If if the military is, seems right for you as far as the training you get and kind of the way they structure everything to make you a you know an asset as far as part of a cyber force and you actually get to see real world things, understand real world things different than you might if you went through some other... I was wondering if you can kind of speak to the caliber of where the training is or where it was and how it's grown to where it is today or any of that kind of stuff as far as going cyber and military. Sure. Uh, so I have a master's in cybersecurity and I can't even tell you like how much, like, if that really means anything because the train, <laughs> and I won't say where I got it from. I got it from a, you know, a pretty prestigious university, but the training and and the four years that I spent or three years that I spent in getting the master's was nothing compared to the training that I get in the military. And we we truly are forced sometimes <laughs> to, <laughs> we, we, I think we've spent a majority of our time just training, you're train, 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 train. And it's really, it's really good training. So SANS Institute is one of our training organizations and all cyber professionals in the military have to go through Fort Gordon, Georgia to do their cyber training. And SANS Institute is the contracted vendor to provide all the cyber training for the military. So our cyber training is pretty much industry standard from a certification standpoint. And then when we are out there doing real world missions, there there really isn't any other organization probably that I can think of where you're going to build a a relationship with a customer and they're going to let you come in and hack their network. And they're just, just because you want to train. So that's the best way that I train my team is be like, Hey, County government, I have the cyber team and we need some training. Can we come and hack your network? And they're like, sure. We'll love that. Come on in. So, and that's, that's really the the best way that um, that I can train my team is to get them out right. there, touch the networks, and interact with the customer because you can't get that kind of training in a classroom. You can't get that even on a cyber range or in an exercise where you are dealing with real people in stressful situations, trying to figure out a problem that no one understands, and you got everybody yelling at you. So that um you know I think. I don't know of any other organization other than military where you can get that level of training that's not only uh, industry standard, but also relevant to the real world to prepare you for going out there and kind of doing this job out in the out in the real world. Yeah, I feel like when you think of like the entry level person going to the military training versus the entry level person coming through other means is a very different caliber of person just based on training and experience. So. Um, but yeah, the, one of the other things I was curious about too, um, and I know, you know, we've talked about it cause I know you've seen where I, where I've worked before and how we've used technology and, and then, you know, obviously when you go to government space technology or what, what assets you have available, um, to solve some of your, or what tools you get to use to solve some of your problems can differ. Um, how, uh, do you guys handle or, or trying to figure out the best way to ask this question? With with the with the threats 
that are out there and the, and the multitude of tools that everyone's supposed to get that's supposed to be the next best tooling type stuff. How do you guys go about building your security stack and how does that get vetted? Um, and how do you build that confidence and what you guys use versus just kind of going off the marketing spinoffs of, Hey, you should get this. This will solve your problems. So I, because we've done so many assessments, we see a lot of trends. We see a lot of the same issues. Um, from organization to organization, whether it's a county government, or local government, state agency, or a school district. And, you know, the common theme that we're seeing, and it's not even tool related, it's just going back to the basics, yeah, yeah. going back to looking at, you know, configuration management of the stuff you already have. So a lot of the organizations that we work with, I would say they're under-resourced, you know, they're local mm -hmm. governments and yeah. So they don't really, they don't have the budgets. That's why we do this stuff for them for free. They don't have the budget to go and pay for assessments. They don't have the budget to pay for all the tools, but the stuff that they do pay for, they don't have the training to know how to configure them properly or to monitor them. They'll put stuff in place and they, you know, fire and forget. And they assume that it's doing the job that it should be doing when it's really not. Um, but one of, so we have to be tool agnostic so that right. when we, when we go out, we can't say, well, the U S government told us to buy this tool and now it failed and now it's their fault. So we try to, you know, we, we give them ideas of the types of things they should have, like a vulnerability scanner. Mm -hmm. A lot of our customers aren't even mature enough that they don't have, they don't scan their own networks. So they don't even know their vulnerabilities. So we come in and we show them like, hey, this is a vulnerability scanner. And this is what it can do for you. They're like, oh, my goodness, this would be so great. So like, as simple as that. And then, you know, we go back again, back to the basics. Once you have a vulnerability scan, you understand your vulnerabilities. Then, you know, maybe you have something that's in monitoring the traffic coming through. It's some sort of intrusion detection system or an IP, IDS, IPS, a SIM. So we'll give them kind of like a standardized package of types of things that they should have in their environment. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, they, um, you know, they are just doing the best that they can with what they've got. And they have a lot of it's uh, even third party managed. So they'll, they'll pay for cybersecurity services. Oh yeah. Who don't, sometimes, you know, the one time we went to a, 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 a ransomware attack on a local government and they had a third party managing their IT services, who was a guy who um, he didn't he closed his company down and he was working out of his garage, and they were still ha you know, having this guy managing their stuff. I'm like, oh my gosh, please no. So <laughs> it, some of those are the horror stories out there, but yeah, so you have to be able to trust the people you are also managing your your networks. But so when we go out to like customers like where you used to work. That's like, wow, look at all what what, what the civilian sector has. Like, <laughs> yeah. look at all this stuff. This is amazing. And then we go to, you know, the customers that we typically work with and we're like, oof, oof, this is rough. <laughs> so big, big difference between, um, you know, civilian sector and the government from the local government standpoint. Right. So I, I do remember, um, especially, and I don't know if it was purely because of the exercise, but the Cyber Shield, a lot of this, the tooling and stacks that we have were all open source. So a lot of it was open source based things, yeah. right? But I still feel like that's what you guys train and use as well because there's really good open source solutions. Um, can you speak to that? Is that is that statement true still or is that at all? I don't... Uh, from, yes. So at the DOD level, they are cyber protection teams who are cybercom assets and who are certifying to cybercom standards. They have a more proprietary stack that they take with them, okay. but all of the rest of us, the, all, all the DCOEs in the States and a lot of the other teams, we do use open source tools because we are more domestic related and we want to show our customers out there that anybody can download right. these tools, learn how to use them, watch a YouTube video and either use it against you or use it to protect yourselves. So we really, really, and a lot of, and it's good stuff out there. So. Right, it is. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted you to kind of hit on that primarily because I think people can learn a lot by building their own stuff. Like if they are yes. able to spin up their, if they have some, you know, extra money or, you know, buy some used stuff, spin up some of these open source tooling and play with it. 
um, you can get a lot of the similar experience or better experience sometimes than go into some, some specific trainings and things like that. So oh, yeah. it's very cool that you guys use it actively, Absolutely. right? Yes. On a regular basis. Um, so I know you, uh, your team specifically doesn't do threat hunting as far as your mission set. Um, but I know when you do exercises and things like that, you guys might, you know, play with some of those skills or try to achieve success by using things a little outside your domain. Um, can you speak of any kind of threat hunting uh, endeavors you guys have done, even in training exercises where you've at least been successful or you, or you kind of uh, adopted some of that methodology? Um, I'm, and I guess even, even our day-to-day -day operations, we are doing some level of threat hunting. So we do have intelligence folks as part of our core team, and we really rely on them to do to, to get the latest and greatest, what's what's out there in the in the intelligence community? What are the latest threats? What are those indicators of compromise that now we can take and look for when we are working on a customer's network? So uh, we we definitely are looking for the things that are relevant in the environment and what whatever is we we're finding in the intelligence community and we get in all kinds of intelligence from all over the place um, as you guys probably do too sometimes yeah, it's yeah. overwhelming so to keep <laughs> up with all of that and then to um, try to look for that kind of stuff so um we and and exercises yes we are absolutely threat hunting um i'm not sure what if we have like a specific tool that we use to do it or um but i think we just yeah, I'm not sure how we, that would yeah, be. Yeah, we're very tool agnostic when it comes to that. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like whatever tool you have, you just kind of use the best of your ability for that right. kind of thing. Yeah. And a lot of it's manual too. So mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to go back to the basics and look, start looking at things. Um, just go back to like the task manager and see what kind of processes are running. Look for things right. that look suspicious. But yeah, yeah. And, and a huge enterprise that would become daunting. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm trying to think of any last minute questions. Is, is there anything from a, um, like memorable moments, like some exciting things in your career or, uh, I don't know, like some like things that just pop to mind when you think about what, what I've done is really cool or what I saw was really interesting or any of those types of highlights. I'm just kind of curious. So the one that like pops out is sort of recent, probably not this February, but last February. Um, the team and I were doing a red team engagement. So red team engagements, way more involved. Customer is uh, more mature. So they're not our typical customer. They actually, you know, have a lot of cybersecurity and security in place in general. This particular customer is a gun carrying organization. So okay. we had to be extra careful. <laughs> and um, they, they invited us to come in to act as a nation state actor and to do the most egregious things that we possibly can to their environment, whether it be physical security or the network security, because they wanted to be able to test their response and just um, identification of malicious activity. And um, this one uh, almost got me arrested, like literally standing in front of like investigators. So, but we, uh, you know, we spend lots of time. We did a lot of reconning and my team, they, for some reason, they think that I should always be the social engineer because they're like, oh, no, no, you, you're good at talking to people. You, you go, you go to the front lines and try to break into this place. So in order for us to get to the network, we do a lot of social engineering to bypass security because the best way for us to get to a network to just try to figure out is to get inside. Instead of trying to hack our way from the outside in, we just get in. So we went through, we came up with a backstory um, to social engineer our way in. And it was about the time when 5G was coming online and there was a lot of controversy like, oh, is this going to interfere with airplanes? Is it going to interfere with radios? And this organization used Motorola radios. So we did our research. We're like, okay, we're going to make a story. We're going to come up with a story. We're going to act as Motorola employees and we're going to try to break into this facility as a Motorola employee or actually get invited in and we're going to pretend like we're testing the radios for 5G interference and then while me is trying to break in my other guys are coming around and trying to put our implants in so we, we built our own network implants with our malicious tools on it so once we get it into an organization we can peace out and go work from the hotel and get out of there and not get caught so 
got into the organization. They didn't even ask for ID. I held my, you know, I stuck a Motorola sticker on my chest. <laughs> I held a clipboard. I looked official and I went in and I said, Hey, I'm here from Motorola and I'm here to test your radios. And this is the reason why. And like, Oh yeah, yeah sure. Come in. So I went to the back room and I'm, I look like a ghostbuster. Actually. I have all these different tools. I'm walking around with all these like wireless detectors and like, Oh, oh the signal's really strong over here. Oh no, but it's even strong over here. So as I'm doing that, my other guy, he got the implant in and key loggers and all kinds of things. And then we left. But sometimes when we are in a facility, we'll pick up things like thumb drives. We'll pick up things, badges, whatever we can find just to show the vulnerabilities. We picked up a thumb drive, took it out with us. Within, you know, 10 minutes, we get a phone call from the police saying, hey, you know, were you just at this organization? They're missing a thumb drive. Was it you guys? I'm like, um, well, maybe. Let's just like pulled over, checked. Like, yep, yep, it was us. Took it back. Um, next day I get a call from a criminal investigator and they're like, Hey, we're calling from, you know, this organization and we need to investigate your whereabouts and what you were doing on this day. And what it came down to was like, I was, as if I would have gone in, I called my command right away and said, Hey, I think I'm in trouble, but, but not, but, but not really, but I think I'm in trouble. Mm-hmm. And they, they said, well, don't go to the, don't go and meet with the investigator. Had I gone to meet with the investigator, I would have been arrested on the spot. Oh, wow. And, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, we don't, so I didn't, and then we, you know, but um, what it came down to was the, the people that hired us to come in, the IT department mm-hmm. wanted us to do this assessment. They didn't tell their leadership. Oh. So, <laughs> so their leadership had no clue what was happening. And the only thing they knew to do when they had most suspicious activity was to, you know, call the police and report it. Right. So that was probably the, one of the more scary ones, but um, funny. And I use brisket a lot too to, to try to break into a facility. If I'm like, looks like I'm struggling carrying a big pan of brisket, then I'm like, oh yeah, sure. Go in, go in. I'm like, okay, yes, I got in, plug in, now I'm gone. So all kinds of, all kinds of social engineering techniques Ever heard of the brisket attack. Do. That's a good one. It's a, it works every time. <laughs> See, I've I've heard of the the women wearing the, like the fake pregnant bellies and then have oh, their hands full, God. and so I then it's like, oh, and, it, and then you can pull the whole pregnancy brain where you're like, oh, yeah. who do you work for? I can't remember. You know, pregnancy yeah. brain. Got me. <laughs> I'm gonna try that, that one. one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I think I I don't know if it's something that you can talk about, but I remember you doing an uh, exercise like with the school where you're able to do like an offensive. Um, with like special operations and you play like the offensive, like coordination between cyber oh, yeah. and yeah, mm-hmm. that one, I, I don't remember all the details, but could you kind of talk to that? I thought that was a really, really cool exercise. And I know it was just kind of a test for capability kind of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, we put together different types of like hacking challenges mm-hmm. that we take, that we take out to schools to ch- train the young kids to be hackers, I guess. I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> But um, yes, so we um, we'll, we will develop offensive defensive capabilities. We have kind of like our own little mini range that we have that we built in house, so we can do that. And then we'll take it out on the road and we'll invite college students, even high school students, we've done to come in and try to hack their way through wireless networks or whatever it may be. And the one that we actually have that we built is if you can hack your way all the way through and get to the industrial control system, which is a missile launch system. It actually fires a Nerf, a Nerf gun missile launcher thing across the room at the opponents. So that one's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we try to at least get out in the community and, and provide training and um, cyber awareness when we're not doing our missions. So we're always out there doing something. No, it's very cool. I think that engagement's important. I mean, that's kind of why we do this podcast as well, just yeah. to try to reach people in a different way and, and, you know, sound like real people and not be intimidating when it comes to, cause I know like sometimes when I see junior people even approach me and they're like, so very timid as if I'm going to bite their head off. And I, I, I know I look intimidating, but, <laughs> but you know, still like, you know, it's most of the people in security. That's why I like cybersecurity is I feel like we're all very much community driven, right? So we're always usually there to help each other out. Um, I think that's what's one of the cool things about the field as well. So. Yeah, I don't know if you have any other specific lasting remarks you want to, you know, leave for the audience um, or anything you want to plug specifically. I'll give you the opportunity. Yeah, I don't 
I don't think I have any, I can't really do any plugs without probably getting in trouble now. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think, um, I think that that was it. I, uh, if there's anything else that you want or want to know, yeah, I'm is always there a question I should have asked that I did not ask. Hmm. It's like an easy way for me to just like waft it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, I don't think so. I think we covered quite a bit. Yeah, no, I thought this was a great conversation. So I always love kind of catching up and kind of seeing how. It yeah. Goes, so. And we're, we're always, uh, willing to take you back to come to Cyber Shield with us. They're, they're going as a blue team this year and uh, I'm the deputy OIC now the exercise. So I'm really well, recruiting. <laughs> I know I've talked internally and it might be something that would be interesting from where we sit to, to maybe even offer training. We did some black hat training uh, this last year in Vegas. Um, Lee, you remember Lee Arkanal? Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. So he's a teammate of mine as well, but he was a trainer. He was the trainer doing the black hat training. So mm. he had a lot of fun. He had a, a definitely a life goal for him, which is really cool. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so he's been doing trainings for threat hunting all over the place. So that might be a really fun place to kind of go and exercise some of our training and maybe partner up with some of the, okay. some of the aspects there. So yep. if you are definitely interested, just let me know because I, I, I know the decision makers now. I'm part of that team, so I can, I can influence things. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, I just want to thank everyone for joining our Out of the Woods Threat Hunting Podcast. And once again, thank our special guest, Christine Pierce or Major Pierce for joining us um, today. No, thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. And if you ever need anything else, just let me know. I'm always willing to come out and share our story. Perfect. You definitely can be a re returning guest. So with that, happy hunting, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Out of the Woods Podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode. For more information or to connect with Cyborg Security, check us out online at www.cyborgsecurity.com and follow us on social media. We'll see you next time.